back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session is on uh, is uh, AG Optical Systems uh, by Dave Tandy. Um, before, of course, we go into that, we are going to show off our image of the week, which goes to a regular here, uh, David Alt, and uh, David's in the room, so I am going to pull it up, and I will give David a chance to talk about it. Sure. So I took this uh, during the Eldorado Star Party, uh, which was in early October. Um, you know, the, the weather was not predicted to, to be good at all. We expected, you know, maybe a day, you know, that might we might be able to do any astronomy out there. But it ended up where I got, you know, a few hours out of quite a few of the nights. I think three of the nights I managed to get some good time on. Um, the I ended up with, I think, about 16 hours of exposure time. Uh, total, most of it on luminous. There's actually very little color. I think I only got three 20-minute um, exposures for each color channel. Uh, so most of this was just straight luminance data. Um, you know, I, I didn't realize there was any actual IFN in this field of view until I'd actually started putting some of the data together here, and then I noticed some of the modeling in the background, so I kind of tried to pull a bit more of that out. Um, and it's pretty faint in this one. I think it's, you know, could be extracted with a little more exposure time from a dark site, um, which I'll try to do at some point in the future. Uh, but I was pretty pleased, you know, given the the not great weather at the star party that I was able to get this get this uh, image out of it as, anyway. Um, so like I said, yeah, about 16 hours. This was uh, I, one of the earlier images with my uh, QSI 6120 camera with my uh, Stellar View 90 millimeter uh, triplet. Uh, so it, that works pretty well. It, it gives me about one arc second per pixel on the image scale, uh, so I can get pretty good resolution out of it and come pretty close to maxing out the actual diffraction limit of the optics um, with that combination. That's all I got, Adam. <laughs> all right. Thank you, David. Um... Yeah, it's a great image, and uh, I see we have a bunch of people in the room, so I'm going to remind you, as always, uh, we uh, do this every week, Image of the Week. If you want to submit, we will reshare the submission thread, and you just post your image as a comment. Uh, we could definitely use some images, so uh, post them up, and uh, you are in contention. Um, and right now, I'm just going to... Oh, yeah, I'll remind you one more thing. Uh, the Q&A app is active. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask our presenter tonight, just uh, click the Q&A thing and type in your question, and I will call them right out to him. Uh, but as for right now, I'm actually going to hand it right over to Dave Tandy of AG Optical. Dave, take it away. All right. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate the opportunity. And as Adam mentioned, my name is Dave Tandy. And I am the uh, founder and owner of AG Optical Systems. And what I'm going to be talking about tonight is basically providing an overview of our imaging doll Kirkham system. And then also I'll jump into a little bit about some uh, common customer experiences when they receive the scope and just uh, detail some of the optical performance of it and also cover a little bit about uh, just kind of what went into founding the company and starting that particular telescope. So let me grab that presentation and move it over. All right, can everyone see that? Um, you know what? We see the presentation in PowerPoint form. I don't we have we don't see it in the slideshow form yet. Yet it seems to have jumped over to my other monitor. So just let me unplug that monitor. See, there we go. Did that work? Now we see a blank screen, but sometimes it takes a second to update. Now we still see a blank screen. All um, right. Try doing the screen share again and see if there's another, if you can re-share the screen. OK. So, uh, should work now. I see the TAIC logo. Okay. 
Here we go. Okay. Great. All right. And the other thing I forgot to mention is we'll I'll provide just an overview of the thermal control system because that seems to be a pretty popular option that works pretty well for most folks. So uh, a question I get often is, uh, first of all, what does AG stand for? And uh, we're a small company. We're family owned. My wife plays a pretty active role. She actually builds the thermal control systems and, and does all the, uh, makes all the shrouds and, and the dust covers for the, the scope. And uh, A stands for Angie and Ashley, which is my wife and my daughter. I thought it'd be easier just to have one A. And G is for Gabe, Gabriel, which is my son. So that was the genesis for the name of AG Optical Systems. And I started the company in my garage out of Nashville in 2010. And really, uh, you know, it's kind of cliche, but teachers do make a difference in people's lives. And I remember back, I don't know, when I was in eighth grade, I had a, a teacher named Mr. Bruce, and it was kind of one of those generic science classes where you talk about a lot of different areas of science, biology, um, and one of the topics was astronomy. And really, for whatever reason, I don't know, I was hooked. And in a short time, I'd read every book on astronomy in our small school library. And in the time that transpired from the mid-80s to 2010, I'd owned several telescopes and modified most of them and built a couple observatories, uh, did quite a bit of imaging, mostly uh, photometry work, and just really enjoyed that. So in 2010, while I was still employed uh, working for another company, I just decided I want to build a nice high-end telescope. And I've always had an interest in carbon fiber composites. I'm a cyclist, and carbon fiber is used everywhere on bicycles. And so for this scope, I decided I was going to make the scope using as many carbon fiber composite components as possible. So I, I built a curing oven in my garage. I uh, made a large mandrel, and I just uh, started making carbon fiber composite a tube. And this tube was about six feet long, about 20 inches in diameter, so pretty good size. And it was a composite cork construction. And long story short, the scope turned out really well. And I just uh, thought to myself, you know, I'm not getting any younger, and life goes by really quick. And so I thought I, I, I should give this a shot and see if I can turn it into a company that I can, I can make a living at. And so uh, since that point, we moved from Nashville down to northern Alabama. We're located just outside Huntsville. And some of you might know that Huntsville has a very large tech presence out of Silicon Valley. Huntsville has the most PhDs in the country. There's uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center, which handles kind of the traditional solid rocket and liquid rocket propulsion systems for NASA. It's where the new heavy lift boosters are being developed. And there's also a very large Army presence. It's predominantly kind of the white collar side of the Army. So the Missile Defense Agency and a lot of other agencies that provide program management and technology development. And an example of that would be uh, the Hellfire rails that go on the Predator drone system were developed and built here in town and uh, they're still managed in town. So it's just a huge tech presence. So I moved down here, worked for some companies before going full time with AG Optical about a little over three and a half years ago. And um, we just found a great location for the company. Uh, we're actually located on a small farm uh, about 15 minutes outside of Huntsville's The Crow Flies. And I have a 3,200 square foot metal shop. It was already set up with an office, concrete, floor, and just really kind of a plug-and-play situation for us. And really within moving here about five years ago, um, in the three-month period, I bought a CNC, a CNC machine, a lathe, and a mill. And I'm not a machinist by training. I'm an engineer uh, through my academic training and through my work history. But I had a good friend who was a NASA machinist for quite some time, and he kind of mentored me and got me got me started on CNC machining, and it's kind of a miracle what you can do with modern CAD software and CAM software. And so since that time, we've added machines and enclosed more space and developed more capabilities. And we actually have a couple companies that we run out of our facility here. AG Optical Systems is our, our, our telescope business. And then we also have AG Composites, which is our composites business. So I'll just give a little plug for that. If, you, if you're interested in composite parts, um, we, we can manufacture, design, develop, and those. And our website for that's AG Composites as well. And over the years, we built several telescopes. Uh, we have them located in about 25 or 30 states. And we have them in uh, New Zealand, Australia, Italy, Russia, Japan. 
and uh, several repeat customers that have upgraded over time. So that, that's a little bit of a background, and, and really kind of my philosophy is I don't want to be kind of another run-of-the-mill uh, you know, cookie-cutter type telescope company. Um, I, I really want to develop AG optical systems in our brand to have a similar reputation to like an astrophysics where if you, or Takahashi, where you know when you're buying one of those systems that it's going to be a good system that's backed by a solid company and people who are very conscientious about quality and customer service. And so that's kind of the direction I'm trying to go. You know, it's a tough market out there, uh, but I kind of look at this as a slow and steady grind and just winning one customer at a time. So getting to the kind of the interesting part, our imaging doll Kirkham, I was thinking, well, what kind of telescope do I want to de uh, develop and sell? And what kind of uh, competition is there out in the market? And what type of scope kind of suits um, my design set skills and, and things along that line? So as I did research, um, there were several Newtonians and RC optical systems uh, with their RCs. And, um, you know, I, I already had existing relationships with my current optician, Terry Ostahowski, so I was bouncing ideas off him. And I decided on a, a corrected Dahl Kirkham. And um, so I, I just went out and tapped some of the resources I have here in Huntsville and just to kind of get, um, you know, a start on a design. And the kind of interesting thing about optics is once you kind of have a decent design or a good starting point, modern software can work a lot of magic when it comes to optimization and design constraints. But coming up with that initial set of conditions where you get uh, an optical design that converges and doesn't have some nonsensical design that works mathematically but not in reality uh, can be kind of challenging and that's where just experience and trial and error comes in and there's plenty of real experienced opticians in town that I know so I had one kind of get me started and since that time I've just spent a lot of time tweaking it based on customer feedback and things along that line and the end result we have today is is the uh, IDK astrograph at f6.7 um, I wanted to have plenty of, of back focus because obviously there's a lot of accessories that you can hang off the back of these things with off-axis guiders and big filter wheels and so forth. And I also designed it around a good size chip because you know obviously chip sizes have grown. I remember using I think my first camera was an ST7, and uh, in not too, so long a period of time, folks are using big chips, and you know your your 16803s are are relatively common out there. So I knew I wanted to design it from the outset to support a good size chip with uh, acceptable vignetting. It's actually pretty low vignetting. And also just keeping with my philosophy of developing a premium product that kind of builds that brand equity, uh, I just wanted to make sure to have premium performance. So there's been many design iterations. I, I think for the 12 and a half inch Dahl Kirkham, uh, what I offer now is Rev 14 of that design. So that's 14 iterations in um, about a four year period. And just a lot of that's driven by customer feedback, but also by the fact that we have our own manufacturing facility with CNC. Um, I do all the optical design, and I'm also the mechanical designer. And up until recently, I basically machined everything on the telescopes as well. So it's kind of a almost a one man show um, all the way through. So any times I got feedback on, hey, this might be a better way to do this, or we'd like to see this feature, it was just a really short development cycle. I didn't have to get any budget approval or anything like that. If I thought it was a good idea, I bought the metal and I machined the part. And uh, just uh, I wanted to make it a made in the USA product. And so everything we buy on there is from USA suppliers. The lenses come from a, a well established optics company in Colorado. My optician lives in California. I buy thermal control electronics from a company in Missouri. Uh, the truss poles on it come from a company in Utah. And the carbon fiber I use for the mirror bucket comes from the East Coast. And so just really trying to keep things in the United States because that just kind of keeps my philosophy. And finally, I, I wanted to have competitive pricing. I, I could, you know, just um, I appreciate that these are not inexpensive systems. And so what I've tried to do is design one that performs very well, but is also competitive with the other offerings out there. And I think we've accomplished that. Uh, based on the feedback we've got from our customers. So the, the optical design, obviously in the name, imaging Dahl Kirkham, uh, it, you know, it's, a, it's a good starting point, the traditional Dahl Kirkham. Uh, you know, obviously it has very good on-axis performance, but off-axis you get a lot of coma very quickly. 
So if this thing was going to work as an astrograph, it had to have a corrector in there. And our system has a two-element corrector. It's fairly straightforward. It uses uh, readily available, high-quality optical glass. And we also uh, make sure that we test uh, those optics and get tests from the manufacturer just to ensure that we're getting what we pay for. And with this particular design, all the surfaces, including the lenses, with the exception of the primary, are, primary are spherical. So this lends um, a little bit of ease to the manufacturing. My, my optician, Terry, always likes to, to remind me that you know spheres, while they are kind of the natural outcome of a lot of manufacturing processes for optics, it still is not easy to make a very smooth uh, sphere that is uh, you know, a good surface with minimal sleeks and things along that line. Uh, with this design, one thing that's kind of a, uh, you know, a, a common question about it is how sensitive it is, is it to spacing? Because um, unlike an RC design where you can have a moving secondary mirror, uh, in a doll Kirkham, Generally, you're going to get the, the best optical performance when that distance between the secondary and that corrector element is fixed. So in our systems, the, the secondary mirror is fixed, the primary mirror is fixed, and the corrector is, is permanently aligned, located, located basically in the heart of the primary mirror. Uh, and what this all means is that that back focus position is fixed at a specific distance uh, behind the back plate. And as long as the spacing is within uh, plus or minus a millimeter, you really still have um, excellent performance out to the corners of these good-sized chips, uh, you know, typically well within average seeing and, and good seeing, um, unless you're somewhere in Chile or out in space. And in keeping with the, the design uh, objectives of basically supporting these larger chip cameras, I know vignetting uh, can be an, an issue with scopes and just having feedback from some, some folks I know that had some competing designs, that's one area where they said there was opportunity for improvement. And so uh, really the vignetting and uh, the, the desire to keep it low, uh, you know, obviously impacts the optical design and it really drives kind of the size of that secondary mirror and the size of the corrector and, and how, how the baffles are spaced and their diameters and so forth. So we have pretty good size diameter uh, corrector lenses in there. Uh, it drives up the cost a little bit, but I, I think the, the vignetting performance is well worth that. And also the secondary, uh, you know, they run uh, in the smaller apertures around 55%. Uh, you know, obviously that's not a good number if you're looking for something that's going to be a, a planet scope. But when it comes to a, an imaging astrograph that's going to be seeing limited, really the effect of that larger secondary is pretty minimal but the benefits are you have really good field illumination and it can cover those big chips that are becoming more and more common. So you know the heart of the system is really the optics and um, when I was getting the company started I talked to an awful lot of opticians out there and I I always kinda tell the analogy it's kinda like um, you know you date a lot of girls before you find the one that you're gonna propose to and so I tried a lot of different opticians and uh, just was never really happy with you know, various um, quality control, uh, delivery timelines, uh, consistency, and things along uh, those lines. And I, I, was, I knew about Terry Ostahowski through just having been in the, the hobby for so many years. When I reached out to Terry, um, you know, he was interested. And the thing I really like about Terry is, is he's just, he's a terrific guy. And he is not only a supplier, but he's a great business partner. And he just kind of follows this philosophy that if I'm successful, he's going to be successful. And uh, he never lets me rush him. Uh, you know, he doesn't let anything out of his shop until he's happy with it. And he has pretty darn high standards, but he doesn't really inflate anything. And he always provides a lot of good feedback. And he's been in the business for about three decades now, and the last 20 or so of those as a professional optician. So he's just a wealth of knowledge, and he's just been a terrific business partner. And so early on, we had systems tested using interferometry just to make sure that the, the optical design from the uh, computer and software we're using actually translated to performance at the focal plane of the system. And we got real good results. 
And initially, we didn't provide interferometry with the early scopes, and it's kind of a relatively new thing for us to provide interferometry. And part of that was ju just driven by, uh, you know, you actually run into some issues where you, you start to have customer support and customer relation issues because people uh, hear about how one person got a .95 system and they only got a .92 system, and they feel like somehow, uh, you know, it's unfair or you're, you're, you're ripping them off of sorts, and so there's kind of that balance in there. Fortunately, I, I just have a great customer base, and I really haven't gotten any of that, that feedback. And I think once folks use the scopes, they're really happy with the results they're getting, and they kind of forget about those numbers. But if they ever go to sell the system, uh, it's nice to have that interferometry test report. It's kind of a way that we are able to differentiate ourselves because not too many manufacturers offer those. And another great thing about Terry is um, really – Last year, he spent a lot of time and effort developing his own in-house coding system. Prior to that, again, I kind of tried everyone in the industry with mixed results. And, uh, you know, I was real pleased to hear Terry was developing his own coding chamber. He, he had some real good uh, mentorship from other folks in the business who had been doing it for a long time, and he developed just a real high-quality system. And, uh, again, I, I just know when I get a set of optics from Terry, they have a smooth, a nice correction, a good edge, and the coatings are always really clean and very bright. And another thing that we've done recently is uh, we used to offer fused quartz as an option, but what we did basically starting this year was just offer fused quartz as our standard mirror substrate. And there's, there's some different flavors of fused quartz out there. There's crystalline quartz, which is kind of the lower grade, less expensive stuff, and there's fused quartz, which really has no crystalline structure and it has, has better thermal stability and then a uh, lower CTE. And uh, we get ours. Uh, it's an optical grade fused quartz uh, from a, a guy that's been in the business for a long time, good competitive pricing and reliable delivery. So now with all of our scopes, we offer uh, fused quartz as, as standard. And when, when folks ask me why fused quartz, it's really, um, you know, you're not going to see a quantum difference. Uh, in performance. Uh, obviously the CTE being about a sixth that of Pyrex or the modern equivalent of Pyrex which is Supermax 33 it has benefits when it comes to the focus stability and um, the figure stability as the telescope school, uh, cools but really it's kind of getting that telescope cooled quickly and reducing those thermal cur currents that has uh, the most uh, profound effect on uh, the performance you know outside the atmosphere and, and, and the quality of the optics. But the nice thing about fused quartz is it kind of eliminates any of those issues, especially when you get to the larger apertures, 17, 20, 24, where the benefits of quartz start to shine. But again, also as a way to differentiate ourselves and as something that adds value to the scope and helps it retain value, it's nice to have those fused quartz optics in there. Our lenses, as I mentioned, are made by a company out in Colorado. This company's been around for a long time. Um, they make a lot of optics for defense, aerospace applications, and uh, for us, I expect a fairly high standard on the lenses when it comes to the, the surface quality and the scratch dig. We have all of them coated with a nice broadband anti-reflection coating on all surfaces. It's less than a half a percent reflection across kind of the LRGB uh, spectrum, about 0.4 to 0.7 microns, and we also have the edges blackened. Even though the system is baffled so that uh, no direct light can really hit the edges, uh, light does reflect and it sneaks its way through that system. So uh, having, um, you know, trying to minimize any opportunity for that stray light to hit the focal plane is what you have to do. And so we have those edges black. And again, the lenses are made in batches by their systems and we have them uh, sample uh, each lens and interferometric, uh, interferometrically test each surface. And <clears throat> and they provide those results to us um, along with uh, a uh, test of the, the reflectivity coatings as well. <clears throat> you have to bear with me a little bit. I kind of got a, a bit of a sore throat. So really the emphasis is on quality. <clears throat> and what you see here is one of the interferometry test report that Terry generates on, on his test bench. <coughs> and the way we test these um, elements is not only do we test them individually, but we also test them as a full system. 
So this particular interferometry reports double fat double pass interferometer. <coughs> And uh, the results are generated from several data sets, and each data set has hundreds of data points that are captured across the full aperture of the system. So it's a good way to average test results and get a nice representative number of the performance of this, the actual set of optics that will go into an IDK telescope at the focal plane of the system. And you can see for this one, the RMS um, is nice and low, good smooth optics. <coughs> The peak to valley, which really measures kind of the worst uh, point on the optics, is still better than a quarter wave. And the Strel rate ratio, which really kind of wraps up uh, almost everything into one number, uh, is 0.95. And, uh, you know, kind of the conventional wisdom indicates that 0.8 to 0.82 is generally considered to be diffraction limited. <clears throat> we like to aim for a number quite a bit higher than that. And generally any system over 0.90 is considered to be a very good system. And for optics that are 17 inch in diameter, um, having interferometry is 0.95, gives me a real good uh, warm fuzzy that it's a quality set of optics that we're gonna put inside the telescope. And the optical performance of the system, um, you know, this is basically pulled from the optical design software, and this is for a 17 inch scope. Uh, you can see that all the way to 26 millimeters off axis, <coughs> Uh, you're still getting a spot size that's basically um, contained, all the lights contained within a 10 micron box. And um, the vignetting, uh, which basically indicates how much of the light is clipped, uh, you can see it's still pretty low as you go out to a half a degree off axis. And it, it starts at 25%, which basically represents how much of that aperture of that primary mirror is blocked by that secondary mirror. So that's kind of just how it's mathematically represented by this particular uh, optical design software. So the vignetting is pretty darn low. <coughs> but this is the optical design software. And you know it shows the vignetting somewhere around 20, 25%. When you put the mechanics in there, that number doesn't change much. Um, you know, this is just for the optics. And obviously, the real telescope has baffles, and it has uh, apertures through which the light passes and the primary mirror cell and the back plate. And then you have to take into consideration uh, the focuser draw tube, as well as all of the imaging train apertures on the back of the scope. And um, in the lower left corner, you can see the actual airy disk size, which is the actual uh, best uh, spot size a telescope can do if everything was perfect. And you see that airy disk is about the size of those spots. And for this particular system, um, you know, that 10 micron box represents somewhere in the order of 0.6 arc seconds. And so if you kind of stick by that two pixels sampling for your best seeing, uh, you know, the scope would really shine and be pretty much diffraction limited into a place that's 1.2 arc second seeing. <clears throat> and that would be for integration times of 5, 10, 15 minutes. So really, in 99% of the times, the scope uh, is not going to be the limiting factor for how well it performs, uh, uh, how well uh, the, the images and the spot sizes turn out the image plane. Now, um, one of the most challenging aspects of uh, creating these telescopes, and it's kind of indicated by the fact that I'm on Rev 14 for a lot of my designs, is it's not easy to hold uh, one of these large mirrors without introducing stress. Um, Part of the learning curve I had early on making telescopes was that even uh, these mirrors that are two inches thick, <coughs> they're surprisingly easy to bend enough to discern um, using uh, a camera. And so we've gone through a number of iterations on how these optics are held, and we've come up with a system that's just really working well. And early on, I was real aggressive with my design. I wanted it to make it super lightweight. I wanted to use thin optics. But as I started to prototype some of these systems, I realized that, sure, you can make them work, but the challenge you run into is that from a manufacturability point of view, you have really tight tolerances on <coughs> things such as the edge supports and how much pressure they put on the mirror. And I quickly realized that um, it's better to add some thickness and have some more margin when it comes to building these things uh, than it is to try to optimize it and make it super lightweight, especially when the vast majority of these systems go into permanent setups on uh, good size mounts with high carrying capacities. So really, 
<laughs> the only variable involved there then was uh, the thermal aspect. Obviously, more thermal mass is not a good thing, but with uh, the thermal control system and the active cooling in the primary mirrors, uh, it's surprising how quickly the system cools down and reaches thermal stability. Um, the, the guy who actually develops the software is a customer of mine, and just out of the um, goodness of his heart, he's developed all of this software and provides it excellent level of support, and uh, he's done a real good job at it and collected a ton of data, and on, on the, the logs that track the temperatures of the, the various mirrors and ambient, they converge pretty quickly, and they stay usually within about a half a degree of ambient throughout the entire course of the night. <coughs> so that's enough to really get uh, minimize the tube currents and have the system at thermal stability. They hold focus very well. And so obviously the carbon fiber truss poles help with that thermal stability, and the components are all CNC machined uh, from 6061 uh, aluminum. <coughs> And everything is anodized. We don't have any paint anywhere on any of the external parts. We use some flat black paint inside the scope um, in, in various areas to help minimize uh, stray light. <coughs> and um, just kind of, you know, part of the design philosophy in, in keeping with a premium product, every single fastener we use, washers, screws, springs, you name it, stainless steel. There shouldn't be a speck of rust anywhere on this telescope uh, at any time. And um, from the collimation perspective, the design that we use there is basically the, the tried and true traditional uh, push-pull uh, design. We have three sets of push-pull screws. They're pretty heavy-duty stainless steel screws, three-eighths of an inch on the, the primary mirrors, quarter inch. Uh, they're pretty fine thread. And we use spring washers to preload those collimation adjustments. And so on the primary mirror, the spring, uh, the stack of these spring washers, uh, each stack imparts around 110 pounds pressure to the cell. So in the case of a 17-inch scope, you have about a 35-pound mirror slash mirror cell and baffle being held by about uh, close to 10 times that amount of force. And, uh, you know, similar ratio on that secondary mirror. So we've had just real good uh, feedback on the, the uh, <coughs> collimation stability of these systems. We do have a few Intrepid customers that actually transport their 12 and a half inch scopes and drive them for a couple hours out to their various locations. And they report that uh, uh, you know, sometimes they don't have to collimate the secondary, sometimes they do, but it's generally just a small tweak. And generally the folks that are using them in observatories, they seem to hold collimation for months and months and months on end. <coughs> so really all the design and uh, you know all, all of the the effort and the optical design and, and the quality of materials doesn't really get you anywhere unless you have good quality control. And, uh, you know, surprisingly difficult uh, just because a lot of parts come from a lot of different sources to make sure everything is, is what it needs to be to realize the performance of the final design. But again, uh, in the heart of the telescope and the optics with Terry, just have a real quality oriented uh, supplier there. And uh, every uh, mirror blank he gets in, he checks for a quality anneal. If it's not what it needs to be, he sends it back and uh, has it annealed. And uh, as I mentioned, all the optic optical elements are tested individually and then again as a system at the time of manufacture. <coughs> Terry has uh, developed a number of reference plates and, and test plates and he uses those for the secondary and it's, it's basically a, a form of interferometry. It gives him a real quick snapshot of the quality of the spherical surface, uh, as well as uh, it gives you a, a quick snapshot view of whether or not the radii on that surface is what it needs to be. And then when we get the optics here at, uh, at our shop, we basically leave the optics in the shipping box until we're ready to build that telescope. And it's just the best way to keep them safe and keep them clean. And once we build up the telescope, um, we put it on our test bench, and basically our test bench consists of a large test tunnel. At one end of it, in one end of it, we have a 16-inch F10 mirror that's about three inches thick. <coughs> it's been tested on uh, an interferometer. Oops. It's about a. Uh, Ooh, I hope we didn't lose Dave. I saw his Internet Explorer crashed. 
Uh, if we lo if we did lose them, we might have to uh, delay for a little bit. Uh, we'll see if he pops back in. Really cool presentation up till now. Um, really interesting. Uh, the way he explains how they design the optics, uh, you get the basic system down, and then it's just a matter of a few little tweaks to optimize it. And I'll, 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 say, say, I'll say something for him, Adam. Yes. Um, his very first sale to me was actually lost because the optics did not meet the quality standards that he demanded for the system, and so I backed out. <laughs> and then a year later, reordered from him. But that, that, that speaks about how much integrity he has, that he wasn't willing to sell something that um, didn't meet the standards. Yeah. Yep, well, uh, I can understand that. Being in business, uh, if you can't stand behind it, it's hard to sell it and try to stand behind it because... Uh, Selling stuff that isn't up to your standards is a way to cost you a lot of money in the future if you're trying to stand behind it. Um, and hopefully yeah. Sorry, just to jump in really quick, just to, to say what Dave has been awesome for communication when we purchased our IDK from him. He's been mm -hmm. wicked. Provided us with all the information, the strail and ratio information as well that came with the telescope. Kept us up to date on where it is and where it's going, and it's been great. And I see that he's back, so I'll stop pirating. <laughs> all right. Yeah, we got you back. So let's. Uh, yeah, how long have uh, have I have I been out? No, well, as soon as your Internet Explorer crashed, that's when. Uh, that's when okay. we went to. So it was right right then. So just a couple minutes ago. Yep. Okay. Hey, hey, Dave. This is Dave in Arizona. I just wanted to say you're a lot uglier than I thought. Uh, yeah, I get that a lot. <laughs> so um, where were we? Quality control. Uh, yes, quality control. Okay. And so, um, you know, you can see the, the things we do for quality control. And, I, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say we've always got it right. Uh, we, we've taken our knocks. And early on, um, a number of years ago, with a, a couple of our early 17s, we had kind of a Hubble-esque experience. Um, you know, I was confident the optical design was good, but really um, our test configuration uh, wasn't as... Um, comprehensive as it needed to be and we were uh, developing optics and manufacturing optics and fortunately we caught it pretty quick that tested very well on axis but off axis the stars were just a little bit oval and um, our, our, our test methodology was not as comprehensive as it, as, as it needed to be and we shipped out a couple 17s to customers and uh, we started to get some feedback. Hey, on axis, everything looks great, but I'm getting slightly oval stars. And they weren't horrific, but they weren't what they needed to be. And so um, you know, I got uh, feedback on that, and we brought those telescopes back in-house, got them shipped back to our shop quick, uh, pulled the optics out, sent them to Terry. He turned them around really quickly. We kind of realized the error we were making, and it was just a terrific learning experience for us. Uh, you know, it's kind of humbling. But, uh, you know, if we could create a system that's perfect from the beginning, um, I guess that would make us uh, perfect, and we're certainly not that way. So, uh, you know, we welcome feedback from all of our customers, and we just uh, try to provide a real good quality product. But when we do screw it up, we just, you know, try to make things right as soon as we can. Because, again, I appreciate these are expensive telescopes. People have worked hard for that money that they're, uh, paying to us, and, and we owe them a, a system that performs well. So the collimation of these systems, um, you know, I, I, I've spent a surprising amount of time figuring out the quickest and most accurate way to collimate these things. And um, while, you know, it's, it, it's not immediately obvious how collimation and, you know, the reflections and all that kind of stuff uh, you know, in the case what needs to be done, I think we've come up with a pretty good system uh, here in the shop to get these things well collimated before we, we ship them out. And really what I use is I have a good two-inch laser collimator, um, uh, you know, kind of passes that, that test where you slap it in there, make sure it's square, rotate it around, and make sure it doesn't scribe out a circle. And then I also use a Chesh Cheshire sight tube. But that's really 
kind of just as a, a check. And so I collimate these scopes after I build them up and, and test them um, without the primary baffle in place because it just gives me a, a broader picture of what I need to do to get everything aligned. So my process consists of building up the scope, getting the primary mirror in the scope, and then putting it on my test bench without that secondary in space, uh, secondary uh, in the scope. So there's only the primary mirror in there, and up front it's just the spider. And so it gives me a chance to put my laser in uh, the focuser and make sure that it mechanically passes through uh, the center of that spider. And again, we've learned some lessons on the best way to do that over time. And what I do is I have a small pinhole, and I take advantage if you put that pinhole at the radius curvature of that primary mirror, the primary mirror is going to reflect uh, an image of that pinhole uh, back at that same space, location in space. And basically what I do is I line up that projected laser spot with that pinhole, and then I adjust the primary mirror until I get that reflected pinhole image to fall back on itself. So in that way, I'm basically aligning that focuser with the primary mirror. And once I have that done, uh, then I move on to the secondary. I put the secondary in the system, and we have room for, uh, it's about five-eighths of an inch of axial adjustment to get that secondary space properly. And I get the secondary in there. I do a quick and dirty collimation on it. And then I have uh, a spacing indicator at the back of the telescope uh, where I place a knife edge. And at this point, we're using our collimating telescope in the artificial star, so it basically sees a beam of light as if it were from infinity. And um, it focuses that beam of light at some point in space behind the telescope. And what I do is I adjust that spacing until it focuses that point of light at the design spacing, the required design spacing, uh, from the last surface of the corrector. And I can tell when it's there because I can insert that knife edge into that focused point. And basically, the illuminated field of view uh, blinks out. And it's a way to pretty accurately set that backspacing, definitely well within tolerance. And it also kind of gives me a knife edge test of the optical uh, quality of the optical system. Because since it's a, a, a point at infinity, um, all those rays in a perfect system would focus to a perfect point, diffraction point, and when you stuck your knife edge in there, you should just get a, an excellent null. And uh, it's helped me calibrate my eye on, on these optics um, just so I can tell kind of right up front what they look like. So once I have that spacing uh, set, I lock down. Uh, there's four set screws on that axial adjustment. I lock that down, and I collimate the secondary uh, using that, that same laser in the same adapters uh, and the same focuser. Uh, to get that beam aimed at that secondary and reflecting back on itself. And I have just had a lot of good feedback from customers on what works well in the field and what tools they use. And I have one customer out in Oklahoma. Uh, again, just a terrific guy. Uh, he's provided just a tremendous amount of feedback, and he shoots terrific images. This is one of his images. His name is Dan Wilson. He has an early 17 of mine. And, uh, you know, and, and Dan has, I don't know how many years of experience, but he was uh, uh, kind of a, a troubleshooter for uh, a large aircraft um, uh, airline company figuring out what was wrong with airplanes. So he's just really mechanically inclined and just has super insight and uh, a good way to do things mechanically. And he's just provided a ton of good feedback. And so I'm indebted to him for just uh, all the support he's provided. And so, you know, that feedback from our customers in the field is super valuable. And, uh, you know, again, we haven't always got it right, but, um, you know, I, I try to listen and, and be humble and incorporate the feedback on how we can improve things. And just as recently as a couple weeks ago, we made some changes uh, into how we wire some of the thermal control system just to clean it up and make it look a little bit better. And uh, so, you know, the feedback we get once the scopes are in the field, uh, you know, typically um, there's a little bit of collimation in the secondary that needs to be done, and that can be done with a laser, and then collimating the primary, and that can either be done with a Cheshire or using images. You basically take an image, see uh, how your stars look in the corners, and then adjust that primary. It's a bit of a trial and error iterative process, but you, you make a small adjustment, something like maybe, uh, you know, a twelfth of a turn, if that, uh, and see if you get better stars. And if you do, 
you, uh, if you're happy with that, what you got, you stop. If you're not, you continue moving the same direction. And because it's important to maintain that spacing, basically um, with our scopes, um, you only adjust two out of the three collimation screws on both the primary and the secondary. And while at a very small scale, that does change the spacing, it's well within the tolerance of the system. And so for the image train setup, um, you know, obviously most folks out there aren't uh, optical engineers and they don't really care necessarily about how all this stuff works. They just want nice, sharp, crisp, high contrast images. And for this system with the IDK, uh, it varies a little bit, maybe around a half inch across the full design range. But the back focus is right around 11 inches uh, from that uh, last surface of that red back plate that you see right there. And uh, with our standard focuser, which is Optech, uh, the, the TCF S3i, um, that consumes about 4.3 inches when that thing is at, at mid range. And it has somewhere around a half inch travel, don't recall exactly off the top of my head. And Optech actually makes this shorter version for us. They've made it for other manufacturers, and so we were happy to have that shorter version. Um, and, and one of their new products, which is getting really good feedback, is their Gemini rotating focuser. Um, it actually, the focuser itself, only consumes about 2.75 inches, but we stand it off, we stand it off from the back plate uh, because it's a fairly large focuser and it obstructs the airflow from those fans. So we have a one inch extension tube uh, on the back uh, of the back plate before it uh, mates to the Optech Gemini. And uh, it's been a really popular accessory for all of our scopes. And I know Optech's had a lot of interest in this. Uh, some of the feedback we've got is now we have almost too much back focus. But, uh, you know, it's obviously better to have it than not have enough. And so, uh, you know, what we do is use extension tubes to get that back focus, um, the adjustment of that uh, CCD chip to where it needs to be. And oftentimes we use uh, Optech offers some 3.5 extension tubes that were developed by uh, Rich over at uh, uh, the Deep Sky Instruments. And uh, so uh, there's just a lot of different adapters that we can use from Optech and a lot of kind of commercial off the shelf adapters we can use. And then, you know, uh, every so often, uh, you know, there is a custom adapter that's required from precise parts. But again, I tried to make it so customers could use adapters that are already manufactured, they're out there, they're available off the shelf, and they're not as expensive necessarily as proprietary adapters. And just from a manufacturing point of view, um, there's a lot of parts that you have to make to build one of these telescopes, and I just didn't really want to get into making a whole bunch of small adapters as well when there's just plenty of those available out there on the market. So I've alluded to the thermal control system a number of times, and uh, in principle, it's a fairly simple concept on how this thing, thing, this thing works. It's basically providing thermal management for the system. Obviously, the truss design helps with that, but even then, you still have a pretty big uh, source of heat there at the bottom uh, in the form of the primary mirror. And so to, to maximize the, those precious uh, minutes of dark sky, you really want a system that you can get equalized and minimize those thermal currents as soon as possible. So this system, the, the components of it um, are the, the controller that you see right there in that aluminum housing. And there's also primary mirror cooling fans, and those are kind of your typical uh, PCU, uh, or I'm sorry, PC fans, uh, the 12 volt. And uh, then we also have primary and secondary heaters, and then three temperature sensors. Uh, there's one sensor on the primary mirror, and it's in direct contact with that primary mirror. And there's one temperature sensor on the secondary mirror, again, in direct contact. And both of those are uh, in contact with the mirror. And we use kind of an insulating sort of tape to help uh, minimize the effect that ambient has on those because we're trying to get that accurate uh, reading on the temperature of the mirror. And then finally, we have a sensor that hides on the back of this thermal control system and pokes its uh, head through a hole in that plate that you see it mounted to. So it's floating in air. And that measures ambient. And basically, the logic is uh, based on the difference between the temperature of the mirrors and ambient. So when that primary mirror is warmer than ambient, and the user can define um, how much warmer is acceptable and how much uh, uh, is basically when you want to kick on those primary mirror cooling fans. So when the primary mirror is warmer than ambient, 
the primary cooling fans are active, and as it gets within the, the, at that acceptable range defined by the user, those primary uh, mirror cooling fans will shut off, and they'll trip on and on as the, the temperature is cool. And uh, again, uh, Gerald's done a terrific job with the software for that, and uh, he spent a lot of time collecting data. And you can just really see that within, uh, you know, for the smaller systems, 20, 30 minutes, that mirror is really close to ambient, and it'll track within, uh, you know, plus or minus half a degree, uh, generally throughout the entire course of the evening. And the same thing with the secondary mirror. The interesting effect with the secondary mirror is it's, it's a small enough thermal mass that even a small amount of heat will cause that mirror to jump up above ambient. And so with the primary, you get a pretty smooth curve of how that thing cools. And, but with the secondary, you get a, a bit of a sawtooth curve. But again, uh, that's, if it's a small enough uh, jump and uh, sm uh, sawtooth curve, then uh, it really has no effect at the imaging plane. And so generally, the default settings work pretty darn well, but everybody places their telescope in a unique thermal environment. So there's flexibility in that system to really tweak it in to uh, support your system. And overall, it's really proven pretty darn accurate and robust. And anybody who's done kind of thermal management, thermal analysis knows that it gets really complex really quickly. And so I'm just, I'm very happy with how well this thing actually works. And, um, you know, occasionally we might have uh, an electrical strike or something like that that fries the boards, but generally they've, they've worked really well and have been robust. So, you know, kind of what can you expect? I, I've kind of done my sales pitch thing and talked about what we do to build these things, but really kind of where the rubber meets the road is how these things work for customers out uh, in the field once they get them. And, you know, not only that initial experience, but over time. And generally the feedback we get when someone pulls the telescope out of the crate uh, puts it up on the mount is that it looks great and it seems to be machined and uh, to a high standard and the quality uh, you know, from a visual uh, appearance is there and once they use it generally there is some collimation required uh, you know I, the the highest pucker factor moment for me is when these scopes are picked up and they're in transit um, I, I ship them via freight carrier in a wooden crate, but and we put a lot of packing material in there, and I've tried to design them so that they're pretty darn robust, but it's still pretty nerve-wracking because nobody cares about the telescopes as much as I do, and certainly not the company that's shipping them. Um, I've had a, I found a carrier that does a really good job, and occasionally maybe a crate will lose a foot or have some scuffing, but generally they seem to handle these things pretty darn well. But with that said, once it gets to the customer, uh, there's usually a, a, some collimation tweaks required uh, to the secondary and then to the primary. And some of that might be driven by, uh, you know, everyone has a unique set of adapters on their system, and really minimal amounts of tilt can still affect the collimation in the system. So some of that's driven by uniqueness of uh, each customer's imaging train and the adapters they use, uh, but also you know, the vibration just causes uh, things to move a little bit. And again, early on when we were learning lessons about this, I was pretty shocked at how much screws will move, even when they're snugged um, over a 2,000 mile journey in the back of the truck. And so now we, we use Loctite where appropriate. Uh, we use locking set screws where appropriate, heavy duty springs. Um, just recently on a lot of my shipments I've taken to putting uh, tape over any of the screws that could possibly vibrate uh, loose just to make sure that they don't move. And it seems to be working pretty well. And really the most um, feedback we get and, hey, how's this work or what's going on, is around the TCS. And um, other than in cases where there's maybe been some damage to it, uh, generally the problems that customers have had with it have been things that are fairly straightforward to solve. Like any software product, some PCs, some Windows installations just do not like the software. And so we've had some customers had to reinstall or update their USB drivers. But pretty much the software issues have always been something that was uh, resolved. 
um, without requiring any kind of factory support, quote unquote, other than emails. And then um, sometimes uh, the system will give weird readings, but in virtually every case so far, with just a couple of exceptions where we've had bad sensor, um, you know, it's had had to do with maybe cables that weren't quite hooked up properly or uh, pushed all the way in and fully seated. Uh, you know, the, the, the combination of um, connectors that we use and plugs that we use, they can be pretty snug and it can require a decent amount of force to get that cable to seat all the way fully in that connector. And so if you ever buy one of these scopes and you get some weird reading that indicates the temperature is minus 200 or something like that, uh, it's probably that one of the cables is not fully seated so the data that's coming in uh, is absent or somehow corrupt. And so generally those have, have uh, solved the problems. We've gotten a little bit smarter on how we route some of these, these cables and uh, how they're connected. Generally, uh, just because I have the background of uh, being an amateur astronomer and basically taking apart and drilling holes and modifying almost every telescope that I've ever owned, um, you know, I try to make these things as user serviceable as possible. And uh, you know, I think we have some more changes coming down the, the road to make it so if the customer does have a bad sensor, then it's a pretty straightforward process for them to replace it themselves and it doesn't require shipping back and forth. That's just not good for anybody. Shipping is expensive and obviously it provides opportunity for the scope to get damaged and uh, you know if the optics get damaged then instead of being a relatively quick turnaround it could be something that takes quite some time. So that really uh, is my presentation. Just I hope I gave you some good insight into the design choices we've made and how we manufacture these and just kind of some of that initial experience of owning one. And so now I'll just uh, say thank you and open the floor to any questions anyone has. Thank you, Dave, for uh, the presentation. Yeah, really, really nice instruments. Uh, they, they, uh, I've heard they operate almost as well as they look. Or maybe it's the other way around. I don't know. They look pretty good. They yeah, operate thanks. as well. Um, and uh, all you guys out there, feel free to type in your questions now and go ahead and ask them. I have a few questions written down, and anyone in the room feel free to ask them, but you said all spherical except for the primary. What is the figure of the primary? It's an ellipsoidal surface, and so it's, um, you know, generally around 70% of the way to a parabola, and uh, so it's really not any easier to figure than a parabola, but fortunately Terry's made enough of these systems that he's kind of trained his eye that he can get it pretty darn close, and part of his test methodology um, what he does is he makes the secondary and he tests that against a reference element and once it tests well against the reference element he'll coat the secondary so it has obviously good reflectivity. He'll then figure the primary mirror to where his gut and his experience tells him it's pretty close and then he'll set up the optics as a system on his test bench so it'll have the corrector element in there, the coated secondary and he'll put the primary in there and test the system at focus and he'll basically use a null test. And again, doing this for decades, he can tell pretty quickly using a null test where he is on that primary and what tweaks he needs to make. So he goes through that iterative process of basically figuring that primary mirror against the other optical elements. And then his final system check consists of shooting interferometry. And at that point, he's kind of down into the weeds of tweaking the surface, but it allows him to really dial out those, um, you know, last couple. Uh, hundreds of a point when it comes to the Strel. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah, so it's um, an interesting system. Where? What is the origin of the uh, IDK? Did you come up with the IDK whereas the Dahl Kirkham was pre-existing? Um, well, uh, you know, obviously the Dahl Kirkham has been around for uh, quite a long time, um, but basically the, you know, the corrected Dahl Kirkham really pretty much all reflective systems of a Cassegrain nature uh, to really get excellent off-axis support requires a corrector. You know, the RC uh, in its purest design offers pretty good off-axis support, but you still see astigmatism start to creep in there. So basically I wanted to start with a design that's really well corrected across the field of view because uh, you're, you're, you're only going to get worse from that idealized design. And so I wanted to give myself, my system, as much margin as possible. 
And so I knew I was going to have to have a corrector element in there. And it was, I was fortunate that I had some good support early on from um, some of the basically optics professors at a local university uh, to kind of get me pointed in the, the right direction of a design. And then I, I've been able to tweak it quite a bit since then. But uh, so, no, it, it's not an original design. It, it's hard to be too original in optics because, you know, mirrors and lenses have been around a long time and they're everywhere. Uh, but uh, I'm happy with the performance of this. Mm -hmm. um, how about the focus shift over temperature change? How, how significant is it? Yeah, it, it's 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 pretty modest, and you know, honestly, I think uh, some of my customers can answer that question uh, better than I can. The feedback that I've gotten is the systems are are very stable. Uh, I, I know there's um, typically a couple of refocuses required over the course of an average night, but obviously that's largely dependent on where the telescope's located. But I, you know, the feedback that I've received is that it's 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 very good. It's not a completely perfect system where you focus once and you never have to focus again over the course of the night. But um, you know, I haven't on the, the flip side, I haven't heard that it's it's so much shift that it, it's detrimental to getting quality data and and a good efficiency from the return photons based per unit time either. I can feed. I can give you some feedback on that, Adam. Um, typically, I started out uh, focusing about every two hours and uh, at New Mexico skies, and I probably, I think when I, before I left, I had switched that to about four hours, but even still, when I looked at the focus max logs, it, it stayed within the critical focus zone uh, almost all the time, and I didn't have quartz optics, and I saw very, very little focus shift at all. The initial focus, uh, when it was warmer, and then I need, probably needed to focus once or twice more as the nighttime temperature dropped quite a bit in the mountains. Um, so I, I would say it was very stable. The other thing I, I will add is, uh, for a lot of times when you switch to a mirrored system for the first time, collimation, can seem like something very, very scary to you if you've never done it before. Um, and I worked, I was lucky to have Ken Crawford help me, but um, we just rigged up a, a simple tax scope and um, the spot was so well drawn on the secondary and he showed me how to take the uh, tack in and out of focus. We did a daytime uh, setup and um, it was so close already. And then we just did a star test to final, but it was really simple. Now, granted, I was not taking the system up and down, but that that, that scope held collimation for, uh, God, almost two years um, before I, I ever checked it again. Um, so, I, and, I, and the only reason I checked it again was because I had thrown it in the back of a pickup truck without a fancy case or padding, uh, just in the back seat and carted to 2,000 miles across the highway and then set it back up again so I said I better check it but it was still pretty darn close. Thank you Michael. Um, anyone else in the room welcome to ask your questions I will continue on with mine if I don't see any. You also offer a Harmer win correct? Yes uh, and I'll give a tentative yes on that. Um, we basically, the market's slow, and it's hard to justify, just from a pure business perspective, offering that scope. We have um, a couple of systems out there, uh, two 16 inches that are out with customers now, producing some pretty nice images, and then we have a 14 uh, quartz system that's out there. And so, but you know, going forward, uh, I may or may not offer that scope, it's just it's pretty expensive and producing them in very low volumes is just a challenging thing to do and so you know currently we're, we're not offering them as we're not accepting orders for those but we may at some point in the future if the market kind of picks up to justify it okay um, anyone else in the room yeah I've got a quick question um, so you had mentioned early on that you guys are moving over to, and I know you and I during our uh, 
communications that you had mentioned that you're just going to move everything over to uh, quartz optics. Are you still planning on offering anything with zero dura optics, or is that uh, no longer in the works? Uh, we offer zero dura on kind of a one-off basis, and um, we've built a number of zero dura scopes. And so, if someone specifically has a request for those type of optics, uh, we can definitely do that. Uh, the, the challenge you're running with zero dura is if you, if you buy it um, straight from the manufacturer, it's excruciatingly pain, uh, excruciatingly expensive. Now, my the, the supplier I get my fused quartz blanks from, he's just been doing it for a long time, has a lot of industry contacts, and often he's able to find surplus zero dura that's still the top-notch stuff, but at prices that are much more affordable. And so if someone has an interest in zero dura, my first option is to turn to my supplier and say, hey, can you get these blanks? And uh, if he can get them in a reasonable price, then we'll do it. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're talking like for a 14-inch blank that is an inch and three quarters thick, maybe 4,500 to 5,000 bucks just for the blank. Thank you. So, uh, so I guess a follow-up to that question. Sorry, Adam, I didn't mean to cut you off, man. No, go ahead. Uh, so I'm assuming that the same level of benefits that can be achieved with the quartz optics are not seen in zero door until a specific diameter has been reached, so say the 14 and a half or 17 and above, do you see any major benefits then to go into zero door optics with the smaller apertures? Uh, the smaller apertures versus fused quartz, I'd say no, because w when you're looking at uh, a Supermax 33 or Pyrex, uh, we'll just use that as kind of our, our basis. Uh, when you go to fused quartz, its coefficient of expansion is about one-sixth that of uh, fuse, uh, a Pyrex. And so it goes from about 3.3 down to 0.6. When you're looking at Zerodur, and there's different grades of it, um, but they're all very, very close, but they do get more expensive as you get to the stuff that's kind of truly zero, you're getting down to about 0.05. So you know, you're going from 3.3 to 0.6. And so you're buying, you know, 80, 90 percent of that distance to zero. When you go from quartz to zero deer, you're going from 0 0.6 down to like 0 0.05. So the absolute change is much, much smaller. Now, uh, you know, once you get into larger optics, uh, even then, I, you know, I just, I can't venture a, a opinion of whether or not it would actually be noticeable, the difference between fused quartz and zero deer for scopes that are 17, 20, 24 inches. My gut kind of tells me no, um, but I, I, I just don't have data or any kind of reference points to, to uh, you know, say with some sort of certainty that you would or would not see a difference. No, that's fair enough. So I got one more follow-up. I'm sorry for being the oxygen pirate here in the room right now. Um, the next question that I have is, have you seen any large impact in between the different types of code or not necessarily coatings, I apologize, the different kinds of optics that you have as it relates to the strail ratio itself. So do you see an impact by going to quartz or going to a zero dura that would then further benefit the strail measurements that are performed by you guys during the inferometry tests or are those specifically for thermal equilibrium or thermal sta uh, stabilization? I should say that would be a much better term. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, no, I, 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 I see what you're asking. And so I think, you know, the context to answer that question is, um, you know, the Supermax material is quite a bit less expensive, so it's going to be used in scopes that maybe aren't made to as high quality standard, but Pyrex can be made to very high quality standard optics. Fused quartz and Zerodur, being much more expensive materials, are typically going into much more expensive telescopes, where the customers and the manufacturers of, the, uh, of the, you know, those systems are going to produce higher quality optics. Not always the case, but uh, it's kind of a general t trend. But from my experience with my optician is I have not really seen any variance in the quality he's provided based on the substrate he's using. Now, from his perspective, there's different challenges associated with each. Uh, zero Dur is a material that grinds very well. It's, it's, it's fairly easy for him to manufacture that, that type of mirror. Uh, it's pretty easy for him to manufacture a Pyrex or Supermax 33 mirror. It's uh, easier on his tooling. The material grinds off quickly. And so from his 
uh, cost per unit perspective, he likes Supermax and he likes Zero Deer. Fused quartz is hard stuff. So it takes more time and it's harder on his tooling and both those are cost drivers. But I can say that, um, I, you know, you probably see me advertising. I have this set of 17 inch IDK optics and I've had them for a, a while. They're made by Terry. And, um, you know, now that I'm offering fused quartz, nobody seems to want these Supermax optics, so I maybe shot myself in the foot. But, uh, you know, these uh, Pirate, uh, Supermax 33 optics uh, tested 0.94, uh, the Strel ratio, as a system. And the uh, fused quartz optics that Terry has made for, for me recently have tested uh, a 0.95 and a 0.93. So, really... My experience from Terry has been that his optics are consistently high quality regardless of the substrate of the material. Awesome. Now, another question. Holy crap, i got to really stop doing this. I'm going to just permanently mute my mic here in a second. But the other question that I have is just regarding the fact that, because I know that you had stated that uh, you're moving completely over to quartz, but if somebody did come along and say, hey, can I get Supermax, would you be willing to do that for them? I would. The, the challenge that um, I run into is, you know, uh, it'd be really fun to just put on my telescope design and mechanics hat and just build telescopes. But I, I have to wear the other hat of this is a business. And so I got to balance kind of the fun aspects of doing new designs and, and all that kind of stuff with uh, what's going to be something that I can produce at a cost where I can make a living and deliver in a, a timely manner. And, uh, you know, the delivery aspect is a, it's a real challenge. And, um, you know, I'm always wrong. And I get feedback from my suppliers when the blanks are going to show up and from uh, my sources for the various components. And it's kind of like the butterfly effect. There's a lot of nonlinearity in there. And sometimes when one thing slips a little bit, it has this disproportionate effect and it causes things to slip a lot. And um, so, uh, you know, the thing I run into with offering Supermax and Quartz is what I found was, you know, I'll get onesies and twosies. Someone, I'll have a Supermax sale, then I have a Quartz sale, then I have a Supermax sale, then I have a, uh, a Quartz sale. And what happens then is it's more difficult for me to order materials in volume and get the price breaks associated with that. And then, just like anybody that makes stuff, it's better to make a lot of things that are the same at the same time. And my optician uh, is, that, is that way. He makes a ton of optics for a lot of different people. And for me, um, it, it's just better for me to send him and better for him to make the optics in batches. And so that's part of the reason I standardized on Fuse Quartz was so I could get just a little more predictability with... Uh, ordering materials and, and make it a little easier for Terry to work on everything at one time. It's better for his schedule. It helps have consistent quality and it just makes it easier from the business management aspect. So with that said, I, I will offer Supermax and I could offer Zerider, but the caveat to that is it may impact lead time because instead of ordering four sets of optics at one time, um, I might have to fit that Supermax into a production run of quartz, but that production run of quartz may not take place for two or three months, so it could push out the lead time on the scopes. And so, and really, uh, you know, that, that's been the biggest challenge with running this business is trying to get delivery times down because for these items that are niche items that are very expensive to make, and telescope companies are small. You don't see a you know, at least premium telescope make, making companies are small. Uh, you know, it's just a challenge to try to keep things in the production pipeline such that I can deliver these things on time. Now, we've taken steps towards that. I've outsourced a lot more of the parts. I buy them in batches. I get them. I'm, I'm super pleased. Optech makes a lot of my smaller parts, and they just do an awesome job. They're terrific to work with. And so now I basically am inventorying complete part sets for telescopes. And telescopes, and I have, uh, you know, a few dozen of those on hand. And I buy the lenses in, in large volume because you have to to get any kind of price break on that. So kind of the last 
part uh, of that uh, you know, leg of the stool is getting the reflective optics lined up to where I can get them in batches. And so I've considered going to kind of fix production runs. I've done that with the 10 inch scope recently. It seems to work pretty well, but I kind of hate to shoehorn customers into, uh, you know, I don't want to kind of force anybody's hand to order something because yeah, their timing may not work with my timing. Um, so, but anyhow, th that's been the biggest challenge really. Now that I've kind of got designs where I want to, is getting that lead lead time down, and part of that's been managing what the mirrors are made of. I was muted. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Great questions, Hytham. Don't uh, don't hesitate to ask questions like that. Um, and uh, great presentation. I do not see any questions coming from outside in Q and A. Despite the fact that there are a bunch of you out there in the room, um, I guess you are all just in awe of the design. But uh, I do again want to thank uh, thank Dave for coming on. Uh, I'll mention this um, next week. Uh, Robert Stevens will be on, and he his presentation is on building a remote observatory and asteroid photometry. So we're gonna get a couple different things out of him. Um, and uh, I don't know, does anyone else inside the room have any other questions? Or, uh, Dave, do you have any other comments you'd like to make? I've got one other question that has nothing to do with the telescope side of your business. <laughs> so I hope that's okay. Is everyone okay with that? Absolutely. All right, great. So it's just we're going to the AG Composites. Now, I'm assuming that the, all the composites, and I could just easily Google this and look it up on your site, but I'm assuming the composites are all for the lowers on... Uh, on rifles or shotguns or anything else of that matter, do you ever plan on making upper receivers, or is that just a whole other ball game that you just don't want to get involved with? Uh, it's uh, are you you're talking about making them out of composite material? No, not necessarily composites, because I think the engineering behind that might. I think there's yeah, this the physics and the engineering behind that might be a little bit too complex for a for an upper. Yes, and so yeah, that's yeah we we that's the I agree with that opinion on the uppers for ARs out of composite materials, but no, we haven't looked at making uppers. Uh, you know, generally we provide uh, carbon fiber composite stocks for a couple different platforms, and we're we're kind of an OEM manufacturer for some companies that make lightweight hunting rifles and things like that. But we're really you know, we're starting to expand out of uh, you know the firearms market to look at composite opportunities in other areas. So just again trying to diversify. But the gun stuff is a lot of fun. Because um, I'm just fortunate, I'm out out of town. I'm on my 20 acre farm. So if any of y'all ever call me and you hear a donkey in the background or a roaster crowing, that's the reason why. I'm 25 feet away from about 100 different farm animals. And but the nice thing about that is it's dark skies. It's nice and quiet. And when we make a new uh, stock for a gun, I can literally walk out my door and just shoot in my back property, and there's nobody behind me for miles. So. Um, there's a lot of fun toys to play with in this shop when it, between telescopes, uh, big heavy-duty machines that take a lot of power and c cut metal very quickly, and guns. So we're having a good time. That's awesome. So you guys, did you say that you're going to be expanding the number of platforms that you currently support, so moving away from uh, hunting rifles over to AR platforms? Uh, we, we have dabbled with uh, handguards for ARs, but that's, that's a kind of a commodity market. And so generally we're sticking to more of the hunting rifles and we're going to start to move into more tactical type stocks. For those guys who like to build up those uh, long range tack drivers. That's really cool. So do you guys, are you guys getting into any 3D printing at all of any of these parts or are you just uh, using standard manufacturing procedures at this time? Um, you know, I thought about the 3D printing. It's pretty expensive uh, from a capital investment point of view. Right now basically on our composites, we, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm the CAD engineer guy, so I, I'll, I'll create a three-dimensional model of a stock, and we'll make a, a mold, a cavity-type mold, and we basically lay up the composites on each side of the mold, put a bladder in there, inflate it to 80, 90 PSI, then cook it in our curing oven, and then do some other material, uh, some other material processes to that, and then we'll put it on our CNC machine and mill out the inleted area where the, the barreled action mates to the stock. And so it's a whole other ball game from telescopes. But I can tell you that the enjoyable thing about these stocks are is they're a monolithic piece 
and carbon fiber composite is strong, durable, tough stuff. So there's not much that goes wrong with them at all. Uh, you can practically, the UPS guy could drive over the box and probably wouldn't hurt the stock. So they, they're kind of a fire and forget product. We send it out, the customer gets back and says, hey, this thing's awesome, looks great, shoots good, and there's no collimation, no TCS or software glitches or anything like that. So they're kind of almost a zero customer support issue type product. That's really cool. So do you offer, so similar to that in your telescope line, you've got the strail ratios that you offer for optics. Do you have a grading level that you offer for your uh, for your lowers or your composites for the guns themselves? No, we don't. Uh, you know, we use good quality material, give us the same philosophy uh, toward commit to quality and customer service underlying both companies. So we use just quality carbon fiber composites and epoxies and uh, just good materials, and we've really uh, beat the heck out of these designs. You know, composites engineering and stress testing is, again, it gets complicated extremely quickly, and you can spend a ton of money on just analyzing, paralysis by analysis, if these things are going to work. So our approach has basically been build it, destroy it, and we kind of get to the point where we beat the heck out of these things, and if they hold up, we know they're pretty much indestructible, and then you go out and shoot hundreds and hundreds of rounds through them and make sure they work well and you have tight groups, and then you're pretty confident they have a good product. Awesome. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate the info. Thanks. Sure. Very cool. Did you say you were a cyclist as well? I am, and that's kind of what got me started in composites yeah. from, you know, I don't know, the 80s or when composites started to kind of first show up, and it was aluminum bikes, and now pretty much everything high-end, unless it's a custom bike, is carbon fiber. And I thought about dabbling in that, but again, it's a niche market, and you can only do so many things well. So I just ride my bicycle. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, you can jump into any business you uh, you're interested in, but then your interest in it changes. Yeah, uh, but very cool. Yeah, um, on Hytham's question, are are three D printers able to print high strength composites like that, or no? Uh, I know they're starting to print composite type materials. Composites are a pretty big class of materials. I, I have seen a few articles on printing carbon fiber composites. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I do not know uh, the technical answer to that. My gut tells me that uh, you know, like unidirectional carbon fiber is still going to be stronger than something that's printed, but I can't say that with authority. Mm -hmm. I can talk on that. We've had a couple of guys come in from Carnegie Mellon who um, have developed a couple different kinds of carbon fiber 3D printers, but they're still somewhat manually intensive. They're not like the FDM printers or the laser centering printers where you just you know, sl slice your uh, CAD model and let it go. You have to design very specifically for it, and then you also have to help out a little bit um, with the printer along the way. Okay. Yeah, I don't know of any composite 3D printing either. It was just more a question of uh, curiosity. Because I know NASA uses some 3D printed parts now, at least for some of their thrust components. I'm not sure if you guys have ever had seen, got to, a chance to see that article. It's really, really cool. But they're definitely doing some really awesome things with 3D printing. So, so do the airline companies as well. Um, the carbon fiber ones are very cool, and they work quite well. The problem is the way that the carbon fiber works, the, you know, your stress areas and the corners, um, you get this rippling and it just doesn't, it doesn't work quite like it can work if you actually lay it all out by hand. And, um, you know, we do the same thing where we create the molds and put the bladders in and stuff and it's just, the quality is not comparable yet with the carbon fiber 3D printers. All right. Uh, I'll add in real quick for them. If anybody would like um, uh, user feedback, because we don't always trust what vendors tell us, um, mm -hmm. feel free to contact me, and I have about a two-and-a-half-year experience with the equipment and can give you my opinion on the quality and um, how well everything's built and a little bit about Dave's integrity. Um, and sometimes it's hard for someone to get a, a brand name built and um, Dave's done a pretty darn good job and uh, I'll just say that I was extremely pleased and uh, hopefully uh, uh, anybody has, like I said, anybody has any questions feel free to contact me and I'll give you my feedback as well as 
some images or test shots or anything you'd like to see. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, that's Mike Miller, uh, VPCIRC on Cloudy Nights. And I believe, Python, do you have yours yet? Or, or have you used yours yet, I should ask? No, I haven't. I don't have mine yet. We're waiting on the, uh, the Gemini Optic focuser mm -hmm. to come in from the guys at Optic. So I'm looking forward to using it myself. So as soon as I get it, yeah, like Mike, you guys, feel, please feel free and reach out to me. You'll get nothing but uh, straight out, honest, blunt truth mm -hmm. as well. So. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Dave, thanks again. Um, sure. It was a great presentation. Uh, beautiful systems, and uh, I can't wait to see a few of, uh, we'll hide them to get his, and mm -hmm. to see more of uh, Mike Miller's images. Um, so thanks again for coming, guys. Next week, building a remote observatory in asteroid photometry, and uh, forgot to say, happy Thanksgiving. But, uh, yeah, see you guys next week. All right, thanks, Adam. Thank you.